Hey, this is Mrs. Bidwell, and welcome to the section on industry, immigrants, and cities. It's the first section called A New Industry, and this is, in, of course, in your textbook, Chapter 18. This is the picture that we discussed in class. I'm just going to skip over that for right now, as well as the graphic organizer that is following here, because we discussed those in class. Now, I wanted to start talking about the technological innovations of this time period. Now, the most important of those is going to be electricity. It, Thomas Edison's invention of the light bulb is going to expand into this process of electricity, and it's going to allow factories to be built anywhere. And at following his invention of the light bulb, and I should say his refining of the light bulb, he was the one that discovered the carbon filament that allowed the light bulb to burn for hours. Um, he went on to make several different discoveries, and he did this through his research labs that were located in Menlo Park, New Jersey, hence the term Wizard of Menlo Park. And uh, this is indicative of the time period. For example, in 1910, a million patents were issued, um, and of course among those is going to be the light bulb and several of Edison's inventions, but it shifts this focus from invent it and scientific theory would follow to focus on research and development as the key to technological innovation and therefore the industry would grow. Um, other examples of this would be the Bessemer and open hearth process. These were methods of refining steel that allowed for skyscrapers and suspension bridges and things that are going to really allow the cities to grow upward and outward. We talked about the refrigerated rail car and how this allowed Gustavus Swift to vertically integrate his meatpacking industry. And all of these are going to play a role in the development of the United States industrially after the Civil War. Another thing that played a role in the development of industry in the United States is going to be the rise of corporations. Corporations are not necessarily new, but they become a new tool used by people to raise capital and to organize businesses. Now I do want you to understand that a corporation is a group of people with legal rights and liabilities separate from its members. And the example I give here is the board of directors are separate from the general stockholders. Now I also want you to understand that the advantage of um, a corporation is that it can raise large amounts of capital and this is needed to build the factories and invest in the new technology that we talked about of course with Thomas Edison and Menlo Park. And other advantages is that corporations allow for them to outlive its founders. So once the, the person who founded the corporation passes on, the corporation can continue. It provides for the long term. And um, how does it raise these, these large amounts of capital, by the way? Let me go back to that for a moment before I move on. Um, by selling shares of stock. And so people who own stock, they provide the capital, they provide the money to invest in all these different industries. So if you've ever wondered where the money to build all these different factories came from and to build all these machines and to invest in all this research and development, that is where it came from. Another advantage of corporations is that it has limited liability. Shareholders only lose what has been invested. So if I take my hard-earned money, I take my savings and I invest in a company and that company becomes quite successful, I am going to be able to reap the reward of that. I'm going to get dividends from the profits of the company and I'm also going to be able to make a profit from the increasing price of my stock. The flip side of that is if the company does not make it, the, the company goes bankrupt, then I'm going to lose the money that I invested. However, I am only responsible for the money that I invested. The debts of the corporation are not my responsibility. And because a corporation is treated as a sole entity, those debts are paid by the assets of the company. And once all the assets are gone, the debtors have to assume that debt. And so that debt just kind of goes away. It's just not paid. And so therefore the, the, the debtors or the creditors, the ones, the people that the money is owed to, just take that money as a loss. And so you can't go back and try to get money from the shareholders because that was not their responsibility. So capital, as I mentioned earlier, was needed to build the factories and invest in all of these new technologies. And that led to much of the growth of this time period. And 
keep in mind they're looking for ways to improve efficiency they're looking for ways to increase the bottom line and they wanted to speed up production and improve products and cut prices and all of these are ways to profit more and corporations are going to have to turn to the banks for this capital and as a result the banks became larger as and I, and I know it doesn't make much sense and it's kind of hard to explain but as corporations went to the banks and borrowed more and more money banks had to go out and find that money to supply the capital needed to build those factories and so oftentimes they would go back to these entrepreneurs and get these entrepreneurs to invest in the banks and in turn loaned out more money for more capital projects such as building factories and everything so they are very closely related the effects of the corporations continue with workers we see this shift from well-paid skilled artisans to semi and unskilled workers as we see this shift in this reliance on machinery and immigrants feel this need for the most part you do have those who are leaving the farms and coming to the cities and so you see this huge population increase the United States population increased by uh, I think it tripled by this time period. I can't remember the exact dates. I want to say roughly from 1870 to about 1910. But the population of the United States tripled, and this comes both from large families. People are having more more children. Um, you have also the immigrants coming from, particularly from China and Eastern Europe, as they are facing uncertainty in their own countries. And this, in turn, is going to lead to urban growth because when they come in, where are they going to settle? They're going to settle in the cities. That's where the factories were located. Usually, they were located on rivers or rail centers because they were dependent upon transportation to get their goods out. And oftentimes, these industries would cluster together and create these large districts. And you still see remnants of that today. For example, in New York, uh, New York City, where it talks about the garment district. The garment di district was where um, the clothing, the cloth manufacturers were located. And it's still referred to as that district today. Now, workers were also attracted to the jobs of these factories. And, of course, they would cluster together close to work. That is supposed to say ways of eliminating competition, by the way. And um, so let's change our focus now to talk about how these corporations were able to use these tools of organization to eliminate their competition and to make things more efficient. Now, one way to do that was through trusts. Trust held the assets of other companies. And the example I give here is Standard Oil. And Standard Oil asked stockholders in different businesses to sign over their stock to trustees in exchange for the shares of the trust. The stockholders would receive in exchange stock in the trusteeship. So they're still getting something for signing over their shares of stock. They're just not giving them over. But it allows standard oil trustees to manage the stock. And guess what they're going to do? They're going to manage that stock in such a way as to increase the profits, or increase the efficiency of standard oil. And this was a editorial cartoon of the time. Um, and it, of course, it talks about, it gives the impression, of course, that trusts are going to be the pirates of the industrial age. You'll see that on one of the pirates here, you see Armour, um, which is the company that took over Gustavus Swift's meatpacking industry. You see they're about to push Uncle Sam off the gangplank there. Um, so uh, not very many people trusted, ironically, the trust because... They were ways to eliminate competition. They were a ways to gain control of industry. And oftentimes these, these profits and everything would not be turned over to the workers. They would be put back into the businesses. And so many people distrusted them because they felt like it was destroying the American way of life. So another way of eliminating competition were pools. And I don't know if your textbook necessarily talks about pools, but pools are agreements to maintain prices. It's where industries or competitors will kind of get together and say okay we agree to hold the price at this level so that we all can get a decent price and it would of course try to get rid of some of the other competitors and get them out of the way but oftentimes these pools did not last very long because somebody always lowered their price and the, by and large they were illegal and I believe they still are illegal today and that the pools are of course what was talking about with this political cartoon to the left and of course you have somebody who's representing that's supposed to be Andrew Carnegie telling the police officer this is a private matter officer you, you have nothing to do with it as you see that all these different trusts in the background are beating up um, 
the typical businessman. Now, holding companies own the stock of other companies, but they do not necessarily produce anything themselves. And again, it was another way to eliminate the competition by controlling what the competition does or by lowering the price and driving. You have um, another way of organizing the business, which is vertical integration. And vertical integration, as we learned in class, is a method of organizing the business that controls all aspects of production. And I was not necessarily um, satisfied with a couple of the examples in your textbook, but um, I give you here Gustavus Swift, who was, of course, you know, the meat the meat packing magnate of the time period. He took the actual cattle from out on the plains to the slaughterhouse, loaded them up on the refrigerated rail cars. He convinced somebody to to engineer and to create this refrigerated rail car and he shipped it back east where he had the sales force that of course sold it to the um, butchers back east and so he was able to do that and control his cost and was able to make this a very uh, huge success and I'm pretty sure that he is the one that sold out to Philip Armour not sure they may have been competitors let me check on that for you but I know that Philip Armour comes in there somehow or another Andrew Carnegie also did this with steel and I know that your book kind of gives a different take on um, Carnegie because I think that Carnegie actually used both vertical integration and horizontal integration when it came to steel but he controlled the coal, the iron ore, the shipping um, everything that was used in the production of steel so that he can control his cost. Uh, the most famous example of horizontal integration which is another way of eliminating competition um, is Rockefeller Standard Oil and he used almost any means necessarily necessary that uh, to control or to buy out or to eliminate his his competition and you know he did this through holding companies he did this through um, trust he did this through um, any any way that he could so much so that he came to represent 90 percent of the the oil industry and of course the oil industry is going to um, first be used in the kerosene industry oil was first used was first refined into kerosene to be used in lanterns um, and stoves and then not until after the invention of the internal combustion engine does um, oil become the fuel that's going to run a lot of these machines. Duke's American Tobacco Company is another example of horizontal integration. He bought out his competitors and he was the one tobacco company that became a very um, wealthy and of course controlled the tobacco industry here in the United States. Now this is an editorial cartoon about Standard Oil. Standard Oil um, seem to have its clutches around everything in this political cartoon. You see that it has its tentacles around the White House, around the Capitol building. It's got competitors wrapped up. Um, so it has its um, hands in everything and, and that's really what people fear. They believe that this was eliminating this was el eliminating competition and they could really take advantage of the public in this way. Now I do want to point out to you that there were many criticisms as I've already mentioned about this increasing way of organizing businesses and such. So you have increased bureaucracy and functions within the corporations and the whole idea of this self-made man, the Puritan work ethic of working hard and you'll be a success seems to be going away. So people began to question and started calling them robber barons and that leads us to this essential question and of course I posed this in class so we're going to continue exploring this captains of industry or robber barons and I tried to summarize that for you here because I know we talked about that in class um, so the idea of small entre entrepreneurships coming to an end reduced competition hand in hand with facing increased efficiency of the American economy it raised the national standard of living it transformed the United States into a major world power and it generated jobs so was it a good thing or was it a bad thing I want you to make a decision about that as we continue to go through this unit here's another editorial cartoon this time period was ripe for all of these different political cartoons um, notice that the caption there says history repeats itself the robber barons of the middle ages and the robber barons of today making a comparison to the feudal times back in the middle ages and how you still have the workers and the government and everybody still paying all of these um, huge companies so that in the name of progress, in the name of technology, it can continue. 
So as I mentioned, the changing nature of work is also going to show the effects of corporations. Corpora corporations, as I mentioned, provided jobs but controlled the working conditions. As I mentioned earlier, profits were not passed on to the workers in the form of higher wages. They suffered from horrible working conditions. At one of the U.S. steel plants from 1907 to 1910, one of every four workers were killed in some type of industrial accident. Profits were put back into the company. They were not passed on to the workers. And you also have this process of de-skilling. New technologies, new workers, and workplace reorganization all led to the situation where workers did not have marketable skills. So it eliminates these skilled artisans that we were talking about earlier. So therefore, they have no bargaining chip to go into a job and say, look, I know how to do this particular process, so you need to pay me a wage for what I'm worth. That goes away. Keep in mind that workers are sharing little of the wealth of this time period. Environment is often going to be damaged by pollution and a lack of oversight. I provided this picture for you so you could, you could get an idea that a lot of the pollution problems cause a lot of health problems. And so it's going to be the workers themselves that are going to suffer from these illnesses because remember I told you that workers lived near the factories where they worked and these factories were clustered together there was no government regulation or no government oversight to make sure that water was not being contaminated that people weren't breathing in fumes that were harmful to their health and so the workers are the ones that are going to be the ones to suffer from that. Another effect of these large corporations and these growing factories is going to be child labor. Child labor was common in the garment industry and in coal mining, oftentimes because these were small people and they could get in and out of places that older people couldn't. Parents oftentimes put the kids to work because they needed the money. And oftentimes they would agree with the companies to not report it because they were in desperate need of the money. And so oftentimes they would lie about the kids' ages as well. States and municipalities often turned a blind eye to offenders because these companies had played an important civic role in perhaps maybe the city or the state. And so they certainly did not want to scare off this large company that provided all these jobs and provided this tax, tax base for the city. So child labor continued to be a problem. Women working, the, the number of women and children working during this time period doubled. And of course, women are going to be paid less than men. Children are going to be paid less than women. And from 1870 to 1920 is when we see this increase. There are going to be large numbers of women that go to work in factories, but you're also going to see this shift in this particular industry in what we would consider, consider it to be secretarial work and typewriting pools. And this work was considered to be less dirty as opposed to some of the other um, occupations that could have been done such as working in a textile or a garment factory or um, some of these other areas and unfortunately a side effect of this is that some women are going to be forced into prosti prostitution some women are going to be forced to not necessarily engage in prostitution but maybe to use their wiles their feminine wiles to to get ahead or to use their 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 female nature to kind of get ahead and they were oftentimes shunned by Victorian American society because this is the same time period in American history where it's very conservative and you have all these rules and etiquette about behavior you'll see that picture there in the cover of that book and so many times Victorian America shunned these women who seemed guilty of only the slightest transgression and even those who supported women there were a couple of authors that kind of came to sympathize with women who were forced into prostitution or forced into situations where they were uh, forced to maybe use their bodies to get ahead. But those people were shunned as well because that was just not acceptable. That, that was just not proper. And, of course, this is that time period as well. And I find this to be an interesting juxtaposition of this technological progress, but this conservative nature that no we really must do the proper thing well who knew what was proper because everything was changing so moving on so how did people respond to all of the poverty and wealth created by this time period it seemed to be that those at the top of society cared very little about those at the bottom Jacob Reese was was going to be considered a muckraker which we'll talk about later in another chapter but he tried to bring to light some of the problems that those 
who were living in poverty faced. And he did this by basically um, ambushing people with photography in these tenement houses. And what you see pictured there with what seems to be the officer is a tenement house. And I want you to notice how dark, how cramped and small it is. You had the little stove in there, and, and we'll see more pictures about this later. So that, that was the conditions in which many immigrants lived at the time period. They called those tenement houses. Tenement houses were multi-storied, crowded houses that oftentimes immigrants lived in as they came here to the United States. Uh, they lacked adequate ventilation. They lacked light, and sometimes they lacked plumbing. You either did your business in a pot and threw it out in the street, or you went out to the street and did your business. Um, nothing was done about these tenement houses because the local governments didn't want to put people out on the street. They didn't want them homeless. So what to do about that? And they also had to do something about the large immigrant population. To give you an idea, in 1894 in New York City, there were 986.4 people per square mile. Today it is something like 200 and something per, per acre. Another response to poverty of the time period is going to be the settlement house movement. It attempted to fight poverty by focusing on neighborhood reconstruction. So really they took services to the immigrants where they were within the different neighborhoods or boroughs. One of the first is going to be the New York Neighborhood Guild, but one of the most famous is going to be Hull House, which was founded by Jane Adams in Chicago. These settlement houses provided the working poor with programs to help improve their environment. Oftentimes they would offer them English lessons, daycare or nursery services, health care, um, a gym for um, activity or exercise. They would oftentimes try to help them with legal disputes or simply just provide recreation. Another response to the time period is going to be the gospel of wealth. And it arose out of the idea that poverty came out of the flawed character of the poor. Those with wealth should help their lesser brethren. And you see this editorial cartoon with Andrew Carnegie. And he was one of the early proponents of it. And he believed that those who had, who had amassed these tremendous fortunes should give back and give people an opportunity to try to rise themselves out of poverty. Although lots of times these individuals believed that it was a flaw in the character of the poor that kept them poor. Um, Andrew Carnegie is probably most famous for the libraries. He, because of his own experience, believed that a, a man should be able to go and learn a skill or a trade or learn something by going and reading a book. And so he is going to be really the father of the public library system. Um, of course, there are good things and bad things about his public library system, but it was a way that he gave, he gave back. Many of those who adhered to this idea of the gospel of wealth thought that efforts to help the poor had little effect, and oftentimes many of these civic gifts that they gave back to the community oftentimes just benefited the wealthy as well. It yeah, needs you to remember things like the Rockefeller Center, you have Carnegie Hall and those things that provided arts, but those are not exclusively for the rich. Of course, anybody can enjoy those things, but it arose out of this idea that this very much, this very Anglo-Saxon idea that there were those who were destined for greatness and those had a responsibility to give back to those who were not destined for greatness. Another response to the wealth and poverty of the time period is going to be social Darwinism. And this is going to be um, a corruption of the idea of, of Darwin's theory of evolution. Now Darwin said that evolution occurs through competition of species and so Herbert Spencer is going to be the one that applies this to society and he says that the strong survive or in, in society's case the, they become wealthy, the weak die or they are the ones that suffer from poverty and many of the wealthy of the time period adhere to this idea. Keep in mind that that kind of goes in line with the idea that there was some flawed character in the poor that allowed them to become poor in the first place. Many of these wealthy individuals having forgotten that they started at the bottom as well. Um, it was useless according to these people because the fit survive and the weak perish um, and as a result humanity moves forward and so it was useless for government or private agencies to intercede on the behalf of the poor. Rockefeller gives an excellent example of this because he was quoted as saying that um, 
social Darwinism is the working out of a law of nature and a law of God. And so why help the poor? If they're destined for greatness, they'll rise up out of it. If not, they're just going to wither away and die. It's a very harsh way of looking at things at the time period. Another effect of this time period is going to be the organization of workers. Workers are very much going to be at the mercy of economic downturns. And so you have the Panic of 1873, the Panic of 1893, which really are just recessions, but cause widespread job losses. And so workers decide that they're going to fight back and try to regain some of that independence that they had lost to industrial capital and the, the growth of these machines and how they're taking over their jobs and taking, uh, taking away their skills. And so the workers fight back. The first example of this is going to be the, the railroad strike of 1877, um, commonly known as the Great Railroad Strike or the Great Uprising. It arose out of the B&O Railroad Strike over pay cuts. President Hayes sent troops to protect the railroad's property and railroad, railroad workers in the East and Midwest sympathized so they go on strike too so it spreads. Violence breaks out in the East, spreads to San Francisco and, um, and in Texas. Another example is going to be the Knights of Labor which are going to be led by Terrence Powderly and basically this is a series of strikes and boycotts in order to show support for workers who are striking over pay cuts. A rally was planned in Haymarket Square in Chicago to protest the killing of a striker on May Day, which was May 1st. And at that rally, a bomb explodes and kills several people. The leaders, Terrence Patterly, denounce anarchism, but anarchism and radicalism is going to be associated with labor unions and they're going to be blamed for this violence that broke out. And as a result, the Knights of Labor are going to lose membership and are virtually going to disappear from the union landscape at this time period. Another example of organization of workers is going to be the American Federation of Labor. And this is specifically going to be a craft union, which means that it is a, a union that members are skilled workers. It does not include unskilled workers. It also excluded other groups like African Americans and women. But this is where you see the idea of bread and butter unionism. This is also going to be an idea that's going to be shared by the International Workers of the World or the IWW known as the Wobblies. And this is the idea of focusing on problems that directly affect the workers, working conditions, pay, sick leave, and things of that nature as opposed to the political activism of the time period focused by some of the other unions. This is going to be an extremely, extremely popular union, but in the end it's going to come to an end as well as it um, loses the Battle of the Homestead Strike. Um, the Homestead Strike took place at a U.S. steel plant in Homestead, Pennsylvania. It was also a company town in which the company provided everything that the workers needed, housing, food, the, the company um, store. People basically got uh, vouchers that they could spend in the company store that was supposed to provide them with everything. Henry Frick, who was Carnegie's plant manager, refused to renew the collective bargaining agreement with the union. He said, hey, I'll individually negotiate with each one of the workers, but I am not going to renew that collective bargaining agreement with the union. Now keep in mind a collective bargaining agreement was just a way to negotiate between uh, workers or having representatives that represent the workers in management. Frick locked workers out of the facility and replaced them with scabs and that's what scabs are. They're simply replacement workers who are non-union workers and he also hired Pinkerton detectives to protect the scabs, over 300 of them, as they came in to work. So union workers and others seized control of the roads and utilities. Keep in mind this was a, an, an entire town or community that revolved around this plant and so they were successful successful in pushing Frick's forces back. However, the Pennsylvania governor sent in troops on behalf of U.S. Steel, which of course reversed that success against the Pinkerton detectives. And because the Union was unable to work out an agreement, they worked for four months. In the end, the Union is forced to give up and so no gains were made and so that Union just kind of goes away. Another example is going to be the Pullman strike. It was a strike against the Pullman Palace Sleeping Car Company. And basically um, it was over some pay cuts to workers who lived in a model community much like the homestead, but this is Pullman. 
and no corresponding decrease in the rents for the housing. And so there's a strike that starts. So American Railway Union leader Eugene V. Debs says, hey, look, this is what we're going to do. Y'all boycott and, have in, and refuse to have anything to do with the Pullman Palace car. So don't hook it up. Don't have anything to do with it. And so this is quite successful. But it's also scary because it brings railroad traffic to a standstill across the country. And many people are aggravated by this and of course business and factory owners and corporations of course are infuriated by this because it's cutting into their bottom line and there's an injunction that's going to be filed because one of the companies discovered that it is illegal to interfere with the delivery of the mail and so they hooked the mail cars up to the Pullman Palace cars and so by making it illegal to interfere with the delivery of mail if they refuse to hook up the rail car the Pullman Palace cars to the mail cars and they were violating the law. Um, Eugene Dead refuses still to hook up um, trains, and so he gets arrested. But in the end, um, the Pullman strike comes to a close without any gains for workers. Uh, so, leads us back to the question. Robber barons or captains of industry? So, based on the information presented, as well as the textbook and the videos, what conclusion can you make about the leaders of industry in this time period? So I want you to provide three pieces of evidence and an exclamation why each piece of evidence supports your decision. Keep in mind, you may choose not to have an either or. You may have to argue both sides of it. So keep that in mind. Now this brings us to a close for this section. I told you it would be long, so I hope that you um, were able to get uh, learn something new about this information. And so I will be uh, talking with you in class, and have a good night. Bye-bye.